Facebook and YouTube. This is Robert Jenkins. How you doing? It is a Tuesday afternoon, 5.30 on time. As always, me and my wife like to take out the time first to say thank you for just supporting us in the ministry that God has given us. We thank you for that. We thank you for the thumbs. We thank you for the hearts. And we just like to tell you every day that we appreciate you. Uh, we don't want to take advantage of that. A lot of people are consistent and faithful and loyal and come on consistently. And they are be anticipating coming on and we just appreciate you taking out the time of your day to be able to come on we bless you for that and we thank you for that good to see everybody uh, as always we ask you to share this on your page please share it. it's good to see you Monica please share this on your page sister Perry God bless you please share this on your page hit that share button and also I've learned yesterday through my wife that you can tag people why I'm teaching, you know, you can hit that share button and then there's a tag button or, or to invite friends and you can invite as many people that's on your friend list uh, while we're speaking. So please do that and uh, let's get the numbers large so people can hear a word from the Lord to be able to free them from whatever they may be going through. Also, we ask you to share, not only just share it, but invite people. Tell people to come out, spread the news on your job when you go to work, uh, when you go to church. Look, I, there's a ministry that I listen to on, on Facebook, five days out of a week. Come check him out. Please do that. Well, you know, God has call, called me to uh, evangelize to the world. Good to see everybody. So it's so important that you help me spread um, the gospel out through your friends and through your connections. This week we've been talking about, and we're going to be talking about, we did part one yesterday, of kryptonite in the kingdom kryptonite in the kingdom now this is not one of those uh, shouting messages make you speak in tongues basically this particular message good to see you Jamie is about the exposure in the kingdom that has weakened us as a people okay and I'm not a person who preach a lot of church hurt and church pain and church problems but I was, I've been assigned to this week to expose a lot of things that have hurt us and the whole reason why I'm exposing this is so that we can be healed uh, some things have to stop. We can't keep doing it the way we've been doing it and expect for God to be pleased and expect for us to grow. If you've ever been damaged by anything, if you've ever been damaged or controlled, you understand the pain of it. A person who's been raped, they try to warn people about predators so that the next person won't experience what they experienced. If you've ever been on crack and God has delivered you, you want to spread the news of how dangerous that drug is so that somebody else won't be a victim of what you were a victim of. Well, if we want to warn people about being raped and warn people about being on crack and drugs, then we need to warn people about the kryptonite that is in the kingdom of God. It's a sad thing to say that when you walk into a church, you may experience more pain and more hurt and more devastation and more rejection than you ever experienced in your life from the very people that should have given you love and embrace you. We should be able to trust pastors. We should be able to trust uh, apostles and, and evangelists. But the bottom line is that there are wolves in sheep clothing. There are false teachers, false apostles, false uh, leadership. There's immaturity. And we have to begin to deal with the cancer that is in the body. If you don't challenge it, then you can't change. You can never change what you're not willing to confront. So you have to confront it, you have to challenge it, and bring it to a level of change. And uh, one person put, I think it was Jamie put, and I'm giving you medicine. I'm giving you medicine to not only to indicate what is wrong with the kingdom and the kryptonite that is in the kingdom, but how to come out of it. I preach a lot of positive messages of how to recover, how to move forward, but we have to deal uh, with these issues in the church. And there is uh, imperative that we do that. I'm a person who pastored the church. I know what it is to pastor. I've built, I don't know how many different churches I've helped establish. So I'm not a rookie at this. I've been preaching over 40 years. I'm not a novice at this. So I'm giving you from my experience. I'm giving you from my training. And I'm giving you from the Holy Ghost of what we need to deal with uh, concerning, uh, and I label it the kryptonite in the church. Uh, I love superheroes. And if you study the life of Superman, Superman it's different than Batman and, and Spider-Man. You know, Batman was bit by a bat and Spider-Man bit by a spider. But Superman was born Superman. He was born Superman. He came here as Superman. And his really his costume is Clark Kent. He's really Superman. But he, he disguises himself as Clark Kent to try to get along in society. But he has an assignment on his life and he understands his assignment. I said it to say that we are born with what we need to be able to be a blessing to this earth. We're born with supernatural powers from the spiritual of who we are. We can do all things through Christ 
who strengthen us. So when I'm dealing with kryptonite, I'm not dealing with kryptonite as saying that this will destroy you as a woman of God or destroy you as a man of God. I'm talking about what weakens you to be able to function uh, based upon your design. You've been designed to do some things. You've been designed to be the light of the world. You've been designed to be the salt of the earth. But if you do not stay away from these things that I'm teaching, if you do not wake up to this kryptonite, it will weaken you and you won't be able to operate in the very thing you've been called to operate in. Okay, so I'm not counseling, I'm not giving the devil credit as if he can destroy us, but I'm telling you there is a kryptonite that will stop you from spreading your wings. There is a pain and a rejection. There is a leadership. There is a Jezebel. There is a witchcraft that goes on in the church that will weaken us to, to the point that we will not win souls as we ought to. We will not become kingdom minded. We will not be able to take the territory back. We will not be able to uh, move into the promised land because we have been affected by the kryptonite that's in the church. And we must expose it. It is more for us to expose it who are part of it, who love God and love God's people than it is for CNN and, and, and BET and all these news reporters who may not have no connection to a church, may not have no love for God's people. No, we need God's people to be able to stand up and shine the light. We have to tell um, um, the, the leadership of this system of the enemy, let God's people go, you know. And, you know, Moses had to go back and, and, and face Pharaoh and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And God gave me a message about 10 years ago and he said tell Moses tell Moses to let my people go no not Pharaoh Moses it's sad to say that God has caused many people to be Moses and to go against the system but when they told the system to let God's people go they took the authority and then became God of the people now the problem is no longer Pharaoh now the problem is Moses now the, the problem is the leaders in the church who had a main day on their life, had a sign on their life, took it upon their own responsibility and by their own selfish desires and became the new pharaohs. So now we have to be able to preach, not to necessarily pharaohs, but now we preach it to Moses and saying, Moses, you are a great leader, but you got to let God's people go so that they may be able to serve God as well. And that's what I'm speaking about today, kryptonite in the kingdom of God, okay? God bless you, Lord. We thank you for your anointing. God, you've already said what you're going to do today. So we're excited about it and we accept it in Jesus' name. All is well and all is done in your name. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. The first kryptonite I want to deal with today is deception. Deception will hurt us. When we lie, when we're not truthful, when our motives are not right, it destroys people and there is so much deception in the church. It is a sad thing to say that you can't even trust the men and women of God because we don't know people's motive for why they do what they do. You know, some people want to use you and then other people want to use you. And deception have hurt us, especially when you are a child, when you're young in the ministry, when you don't know much and you're trusting in the confidence of the leaders, you're trusting in the confidence of the system of the church, you're trusting in what they have, what they are telling you is true, but they have have a deception, a deception going on. There's a false motive. We have people who have masses on in the church and they're cosmetic. They're made up but not made over. This have hurt us as a people because most of the most valuable people and have given the church the majority of their life, the greatest time of their life. They've been raised up in church and from the age of five and six to the 30 and sometimes 35 before they wake up. They've given you years of their life and not knowing that it was a deception. I thought that you were going to be there for me, but the minute that my mother went into the hospital, you did not show up for it. The minute that my father got sick, you did not respond. It was a deception. I gave, I trusted, I believe in the ministry, but the first time that I said something that you didn't like, now you look at me different, you treat me different. Where is the love when I'm not corrected? Or where is the love when I make a mistake? These things are, are, are devastating when you have been deceived by your leaders and you thought they had your best interest in mind. You thought they was concerned about you and your children and your income, but the minute you didn't have money to give, things change. The minute that you begin to grow in your ministry and you had an insight that had increased and now you question and everything they said wasn't God anymore, there was a change of behavior and how they treated you. And this is a great deception when you have wolves in the pulpit or wolves behind uh, the organ. You'd be surprised at the people who's been molested by people in the church. A deception. I thought you was coming 
over here to pray for me, but you took advantage of my vulnerability. I was going through a divorce. I was very weak, and I wanted someone to talk to and listen, and you used that opportunity to become sexual. And yes, they may have made some decisions that they shouldn't have made, but you were the leader. You were the strong one. You were the one that was been called. You the one that has been seasoned. I should have been able to have vulnerability around you, and you not fall to my uh, vulnerability. Just because I'm immature and vulnerable don't mean you should take advantage of it when you know better. It's no different than a, than a grown man taking advantage of a young girl because she has a crush. She's 14. She's 15. She's going to have a crush. We, it's, it's a sad thing when we have deception when you have young Christians or young babes in Christ that have crush on their pastor and you don't know what to do with it besides uh, using it and manipulating it. Even when it comes to my immaturity, I don't know how to give. You take advantage and teach me to give what you want me to have. This type of deception has hurt us. It has hurt us in the church when you find out that you have just as many prostitutes and pimps in the pulpit than you have in the streets. This type of deception that you don't pray. I find out that you don't intercede. You're giving me messages that can never feed me. You're giving me jelly bean messages that cause my teeth to fall off. I can't chew a word of God. You have you have, you have have put a cloud over my mind that I don't even know who to believe in. I, I don't trust nobody but you because you have controlled my thoughts. You have deceived me to make me think that it was about the word of God, but only when it comes out of your mouth. So I have no other brothers and sisters that I can be accountable to, that I can rest on, to make sure that every, you know, uh, or every word is established by two or three witnesses. You don't let me have that. This type of deception when you're thinking that you really care. I thought that you really had love. I thought that you really was concerned about my growth, but you was only concerned about my membership. This type of thing has become kryptonite in the kingdom of God. And it's a sad thing when people have been molested, people have been raped, people have been left to the side, people have been ignored. Uh, you love me as long as I was coming to the church faithfully, but the minute I have some problems and I miss two or three Sundays, uh, you was not there for me. I, I thought you was my friend. I thought you was my leader. Uh, you don't call. There's no phone call. But I hear rumors that you're talking about me, that you're preaching about me. These type of things have kryptonite the, the the people of God. And this is dangerous when you have deception, when you're deceived, when the devil can use uh, a you like he used a snake in the garden to cause people to miss the divine uh, 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 visitation of God. This is crazy in church and we can we got to stop lying. If you're not ready to be sold out with God, then don't preach a message that you're not willing to practice. If you're really not committed, then don't act like it. You know, this type of deception. I thought you was a real praise warrior worshiper. I thought you was a real warrior. This is great deception. Well, I don't know who to lean on because you live one way on Sundays and live another way on Saturdays. I come to find out that you just uh, are struggling with pornography as much as I am. I found out you have a gambling problem. I found out you take as many pills as I do. I find out that you got this many boyfriends as I do or girlfriends as I do. This type of deception is crazy. And even though you have on the long gowns and you may not wear any makeup, your deception is in your attitude, how you talk about people, how you gossip. This is coming from people that I should have a, a form of an expectation to see God in them. And this has become kryptonite in the church to the point we don't know who to trust. We don't know who to believe. Now we don't have a good representation. So if you say you're apostle or prophet, people looking at you with one eye open and one eye closed because those who, who did not take it seriously, did not take the ministry seriously, have hurt those who really want to be a real true man and woman of God. This deception, deception has hurt us. It has hurt us. And that's the first kryptonite that I want to talk about tonight in the kingdom. The next thing I want to talk about is false motives. False motives have hurt us. Well, I don't know your intent. I don't know why you invited me to your church. I don't know why you invited me to your Bible study. I don't know what's your real motive. Why do you want us to come? You, you put me on a committee, but what's your real reason for putting me on a committee? Uh, you say that you see God's favor on my life, but you never, your real reason for having, for seeing uh, God's favor on my life was not for the, 
to build who I am in the kingdom, but it was to build your stage, to build your performance, to build your ministry, to build your church, but it really wasn't about me. And these false motives have, have, have hurt us in the body of Christ to the point that we, it's like I, get, I said again, it's hard to trust because I don't know what angle you coming at. What's your con? Why, why are you doing what you're doing? Uh, why do you really want to bless me? Why do you really believe in me? Because the motives have not been right. We have used people to build our buildings. We have used people to build our ministry because I have a name, because I have a voice, because I'm the new thing in town. Uh, now you want you want to embrace, but you never liked it me. You never understood me. You, ne you don't even take our time to get to know me, but your motive is not about me growing in the kingdom. Your motive is not about me learning. Your motive is that you want to look good, so I bring some glory to your church, or I bring some bling bling to your church, or I bring money to the church, and this motive has hurt us. It has hurt us because we need one another. Every joint supply. I need to make sure that you have my best interest in hand. If you talk to adoptions uh, agency and when children are going through the war between what parents should they be in, the main thing of the, uh, of the agency is to make sure that the, the child's interest is the best thing that they're looking at. They're concerned about the interest of the child. What happens to people having real peer motives? Real peer motives that you're not trying to do something, you're not trying to con me, you're not trying to use me. This should not be named among us in the house of God. Oh my God, these are the things that should have been dropped off at the altar. These are the things that should have been cast down. These are the things that should have been cast out. These demons, but they have not. And now it's so much trickery in the ministry. You don't know if you're giving $100 because God laid on your heart or somebody conning you out of a dollar. You don't know if, if you're really coming to the altar to get blessed or have you been moved by emotions and emotionalism because the motive for the offering is not right. The motive for you giving me a word is not right. The motive for you wanting me to be faithful and, and loyal is not right. And that has, has, has become kryptonite to the body of Christ. To the point that we don't have servants and, and sons, we have slaves. And unless you are a slave, then you are a good member. But if you are a thinker, if you are motivated, if you have your own anointing, if you know what's in you, then this thing becomes a problem. Now we believe this insubordinate in the church because I want to I want to believe in what God spoke to me. But your whole motive, when you when we first talk, there's privacy that goes on in private hours of the night, and you talk about stuff in the middle of the night. Next thing you know, there's changes going on in the church. What is the motive? Why are you doing what you're doing? This is real. A lot of us want to look like we are true evangelists. We want the, the church wants to look like it really cares about souls, but you don't spend money on the children's ministry. You don't really care about those who are less fortunate or have a stronghold on their life. So the real intent for why we are at worship, you say, you know what, God called a Friday night prayer. Really, is it Friday night prayer? We need to raise some more money so we can get some more money in your pocket. What's the real reason for these extra meetings or these extra services or these extras attendance or all these things that you call God? What's the real reason why you're having these programs and you're doing what you're doing? Because the motive for what we're doing has become uh, attainted, has become poison, and it has become kryptonite. In the body of Christ. Man, I feel the Holy Ghost today. The next thing I want to talk about is kryptonite is that when you have deceitful leaders, and, and tell me, I want you to know something that um, um, what I'm speaking to you is not strange. It's in the Bible. The Bible talks about, I, I preach a whole message, the fivefold ministry of the end of the enemy according to Ephesians and he talks about principalities and powers but one of the things he talks about Paul talks about spiritual wickedness in higher places spiritual wickedness those two words shouldn't even go together how can you be spiritual and be wicked but I have never, and, and you listen to a man who has traveled in the gospel industry all of my life. I've probably played along with or with probably every major uh, uh, gospel entertainer that came up in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s. And I've seen so much spiritual wickedness in high places. It's scary to see this type of stuff that goes on. You would, you would be surprised of how... How many download men are in the in the body of Christ? Or how many download women are in the body of Christ? You would be surprised of the secret sins that go on and they really tell of why they're inviting you or why they're doing what they're doing. It's crazy 
And when I used to go to these conventions, I would see more husbands being with being with his mistress at the convention, or or women who was dating uh, the pastor's wife and the pastor. One particular lady, she was sleeping with the man's husband, with the woman's husband, and sleeping with the woman at the same time. But these were gospel entertainers. This thing goes on. This is kryptonite in the body of Christ. And when they at their local church, you know, they don't wear any makeup. But when they're at convention, they got on makeup, they got on nails, they breaking every law out of town that they believe they're keeping when they're in town. So when you locally in your church, then you act like you're holy, you sanctify, and it's how I live. But when you take a vacation, when you go to the convention, all of a sudden you living wild, it's crazy, the things that goes on. Now everything that used to be against the will of God is now legal because we at the convention. Uh-oh, these things go on and they have become kryptonite. Now I'm not glad about preaching these things. I'm not a church hater, but these things have hurt us and we must confront these things. I sad to say that I love the local church and what God has called it for. I love apostles and prophets, but not when we are abusing people, not when we use the scripture to control people, not when your intent is not right. And this is why you give certain people titles and you won't give other people's titles because the intent, the motive behind what you do. And you'd be surprised if the deals that goes on in the background to build churches. It is devastating when you find out that your leader really don't love you for you or his intent for using you was in a whole nother vein. You want to grow in God. You want to know more about faith. You want to know more about justification. But when you find out what your intent was, what do I really mean to you? I have become another property or I've become another brand. And now you want me on the team because I'm the new brand. I can draw the young people in. I'm the new brand. I can make, people, I can make the Bible study grow. Your intent for using me was wrong. And this has become kryptonite in the body of Christ. And, and let me tell you something, I've learned some things about people who are spiritually wicked. They have strategies. And listen, when you are wicked, man, you understand. You understand, and I wrote this down, where there is weakness, there is leverage. Where there is weakness, there is leverage. If you study a boxer, he finds your weaknesses and he hits you in where you weak at. If you find anybody who looks at the weaknesses to use it as leverage, it's a sad thing that we have leadership. This is kryptonite in the body of Christ. That they have found your weakness and use it as a leverage. You never had a father in your life. You wanted to be loved. So they, so they preach and teach you about how much you need to have a father and in love. So all of a sudden you give alliances to these leadership. You you give agreement to these leaders, but they really don't have your best interest in mind. They're just using that knowledge as a leverage to be able to control you. You'd be surprised when you go to church and there's some things that went on in your marriage and went on in your home, and next thing, the next three Sundays, they're preaching about you, using that as leverage, your weakness as leverage to be able to make you uh, uh, committed and really to enslave you because now you feel bad. You missed two Sundays, and now all of a sudden the message is when people are not faithful in leadership are you really preaching the message about not being faithful or are you trying to manipulate me by making me feel bad because I missed the last two Sundays this is nothing but spiritual weakness when you use the weakness as a leverage to control people and I'm telling you it works in the world but this should not be named among us in the body of Christ this is what Peter was doing when sometimes he would preach circumcision and other times he wouldn't preach circumcision and Paul had to rebuke him you need to stand on the truth, Peter. You can't use what they don't believe as leverage and what they do believe as leverage. You should not use the, the pulpit as a place, to, a place to bully or a place to be able to pull rank because you know something. You heard something. So somebody get pregnant, now you're preaching about that. You found out somebody still go to the clubs, so now the whole message is about you going to the club. And you know what? It's wrong to do some things, but don't use the information as leverage that spiritual wickedness because your intent for the message did not become, your message didn't come from behind the veil, it didn't come from laboring in God, it didn't come from intercession, it didn't come from a burden of the Lord, it came from gossip, it came from rumors and now you using the pulpit in a Sunday morning and your collar and the authority as a reason to whip people back in place and that has become kryptonite in the body of Christ. If you've ever been a victim of knowing what that feels like, it makes you want to give up on church. It makes you no longer trust leadership. So now you don't want to trust no pastor. You don't want to trust no apostle, no prophet, no leader because you, because you have been betrayed. Woo! 
And this has caused a huge kryptonite in the body of Christ. <clears throat> a huge kryptonite. The next thing I want to talk about, false teaching. False teaching is magic. And it's too much magic in the church. It's, 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 it's magic is the replace of miracles. We don't need to practice magic. We can perform miracles. We're called signs and wonders should follow us. But wherever you don't see miracles, you wherever you don't see miracles and you see growth, magic is the result of the growth, not miracles. Signs and wonders should follow us. And signs are for those that don't believe. But magic always draws crowds. And magic is a trickery where I have you focus on one hand while I move on the other. We're preaching magic in the church. We're doing magic when praise and worship. We're doing magic with the young people because really one hand is doing something different than the other hand to get us to focus on this. It's the same thing that politics do when there's a real issue on politics. Another crime will be pushed on the news so that you won't focus on the crime that just happened. So it's called magic. So while you focusing on what happened on the east side, you forgot what happened in the White House. So it's called magic. And this is what happens in the church that we preach in magic, which has become crypto tonight because we're not dealing with real issues. So I got you focusing on, on this and why aren't you doing that and why aren't you doing that? Well, the real issue is not robes, Pastor. The real issue is not this. The real issue is that we're not on our face. The real issue is we've turned away from God. But as long as you can preach the magic, you won't see the miracles. Ooh, God. Oh, my God. This is so important. That we come against this, it's it's mixed, it's mis, it's misdirection. What's really going on? What's the real problem? It's almost like people who deal with symptoms and don't deal with causes. It's like people who deal with the fruit of a matter, but don't deal with the fruit of, of the root of the matter. You can you can pick all the apples off the tree and say these apples are rotten, but if you don't want to cut down the tree and replant again, then they'll grow back. So we're preaching magic, and this is how you get stuck in church 10, 15 years, 10, 15 years in a bad marriage, 10, 15 years on a bad job, because magic, been there. and the best way to perform magic is to give you false hope. It's going to get better next year, but there's no plan. There's no execution to make it better. But I, I keep giving you things, you know, you'd be surprised at the people who are on their way out of, of, out of ministries. God was telling them to leave the ministry, but here comes the magic. You know what? Uh, you know what? This week we're going to ordain you. Uh oh, I've been in 15 years, you've never ordained me. You know what? Next Sunday, I'm going to let you teach for the YPWW. You have never allowed me to teach, but all of a sudden now, you'll give me a promotion and a title. So-called a promotion. Or you're, you're, all of a sudden now, now you consider my idea. So-called considering my idea. This is magic to make you stay committed, to make you stay loyal. But the truth of the matter is, you never have the intent to make sure that what's in me is be able to be, I should, I, when I come to a place, I should be equipped, I should be trained, and I should be released. There's some people who's going to stay and be part of the staff, and others who are going to go and establish on their own. I'm called to be, I'm called to be fruitful, multiple. Multiply, replenish, and subdue. You, you can't keep being fruitful and there's no multiplication. One day the apple has to become the tree. There's a seed in the apple that needs to be released. You can't enjoy the apple but throw the seed away. And this is what happened in church. They eat all the fruit of what you have, what you labored for, what you suffered for, but never allow you to plant what was in you. This is deception again. And it's become kryptonite in the body of Christ. So I, I, I can keep you by giving you a title. I can say I'm going to use you all of a sudden. No, you never had a plan, but it's called magic. It's to focus on the small things. Well, well you, you, you may bring up some issues in the ministry that, that need to be addressed, but all of a sudden they bring up, you know what? Well, you know what? I'm going to check the ties and see, have you been given faithfully? Uh, that's a good idea what you're saying, but if you ain't been giving no money, we won't hear you. Magic, you know what? You know what? That's a good idea, but we, we're going to put that on hold right now. Magic, see, this is real important and these things become trickery and they have become we have become kryptonite to the point now we come to church looking for a show we want to know how much magic you can do 
how much magic you can do. Sometimes even in our testimony, it's magic because we don't have really real testimonies. I want to know who's being delivered. I want to know who longer, who's no longer demon possessed. I want to know who's really off drugs. We'll make statements like, you know what, the devil is under my feet and I have authority over the devil and all your kids is on drugs. The devil is not under your feet. The devil is in your home. See what I'm saying? But we focus on how good it sounds, how good it preach. This becomes magic. And we, I need to come. I want to see the miracles of God. I don't, want the, I don't want the magic show. I want the miracles. I want to see people who've been laying from, the, from their mother's womb rise up and heal. I want to see consciousness change when you was a pimp and now you know how to be humble. I want to see ego be out of the house. But this don't happen because we've been kryptonite by the magic show. We have been weakened by the entertainment. We've been, we've been demoralized by the religion that causes the word of God to have no, none effect. For those who needed a scripture for this, for this particular series. Okay? Very important. The next kryptonite that we have, and this is a big kryptonite in the body of Christ. Secrets. If you're listening, I want you to have tags. No more secrets. You'd be surprised of the secrets that have hurt us, the deals that goes on in the midnight hour, the things that you don't have no idea, the secrets of the sexuality. You have musicians having sex with young girls in the church, giving them abortions, giving them diseases. Oh my God, you're not supposed to come to the house of God and sleep with somebody. Now you, you infected with AIDS. Come on somebody. This is terrible because these secrets and no one knows that he got three babies in the church. No one knows he's a pervert. No one knows that he goes around stealing. No one knows who's shacking up and living together. And not that everything should be publicized, but it shouldn't be a secret to the spiritual realm that we don't have any intercessors praying against me. We don't have any watchmen on the wall making sure that any spirit don't come in and destroy the, the fertile minds that are in the house of God. But so many secrets, leadership has so many secrets, soul ties, pastors sleeping with the ministrator, all this stuff. You're more loyal to your, to your pastor than you're loyal to your own husband. You make sure the pastor suit is, is you sew his clothes for him. You make sure he get his tea. Your husband ain't ate in two days. You ain't cooked, but you, the church got to be right. All these secrets because there's some deals that's been made sitting in the car. There's some deals that's been made in the parking lot. There's some deals that have been made in the pastor study. All these secrets that goes on. Find out that the musician making $3,000 a Sunday and we wondering why we, the building fund ain't growing. All these side deals that go on. You know, all these commitments. People, oh my God, I can just go on and on of the things that happen in church that we don't tell. Uh, uh, credit cards that are being uh, assigned without permission. No one knows how, where the money going in the church. Thousands and thousands of dollars is going. Come to find out the church didn't buy Sisters Brown a brand new car and, and Brother Brown got this going on. All we know is that a new drum ship sold up in the church and a new PA system. All these secrets. We don't have true meetings of what's going on with the ministry. Why so and so really left the church last year? Oh, we ain't gonna tell the real reason why she left. We ain't gonna tell the real reason why he left because secrets and these have hurt us. It's like a secret society in the house of God. This has become kryptonite. Woo, Jesus. I can tell you all and going soul ties that don't nobody know about. Besides the husband who wife has a soul tie with the pastor or with the leadership or the wife who knows the husband has a soul tie. Money that is spent out of the home. You as a wife don't even know that he make that much money because he gives it to the church on the sideline. All these different things that goes on in the church have become kryptonite. The sexuality, how much, it's almost like orgies going on in the church and, 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 and nobody deserves this at all the time. Nobody picks this up in the spirit. Nobody talks about this at the revival. You don't want to talk about all these spirits that's going on in the church. Children that have been molested in touch. Houses that have been broken up. Marriages that are in divorce because of the secrets in the house of God. Ooh. This has become kryptonite. Kryptonite, and this have divided the house. Another kryptonite in the kingdom is division. Division. Got to click over here. The click that the people who make hope, people who make six figures, they hang together. People who think they're highly spiritual, they hang together. You got the clicks in the church. Yeah, and this has become kryptonite. It's divided. You got the people who know the truth, who are going to protect the pastor at all costs. 
Hide, there's a difference between covering and hiding. Some people say well, you're covering the past. Some stuff you're not covering, you're hiding. Hiding is the intent for no one to see. Covering is to protect it from the elements on the outside so that it will not get affected. Okay? So a band-aid covers a wound while it's healing on the inside. And once it get enough healing, you must take the band-aid off so that it won't have the wrong type of scar so that the air can get to it, cause it to breathe and heal correctly. So you cover for a certain period of time while something is being healed. Hiding is to make sure that no one finds it. It's to cover it so it cannot be revealed. There is no wound in the midst of hiding something. Something, something in remain. So it's still sick, but it's but you're hiding it. She, he's still arrogant, but you're hiding it. He, he's still selfish, but you're hiding it. He's still controlling, but you want to hide it. Those things have become kryptonite. And don't believe that everybody who say they're covering you is covering you. Some people say, as long as I know your mess and you know my mess, we can have church together. We can have fellowship because I won't expose your mess and you don't expose mine. There was a bishop one time, and I won't call the organization out, but he was known for being a, a, a homosexual, and he was, um, 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 you know, sleeping with a lot of men in, in the organization. Well, they called this pastor in and says, you got to stop sleeping with these boys. You, you, you're messing up the organization. And, and, and the gay guy said, or the gay preacher said to the people, when y'all stop messing with the women, I'll stop messing with the boys. In other words, y'all can't pull me in the office and check my homosexuality when you got two girlfriends on the side and you marry. You got a mistress that you only meet when you go to Memphis or when you go to conventions, when you go to Florida. But I know the side, as they say in the world, the side pieces or the side mistress that you have on the sideline. So how are you going to call me in or dealing with the homosexuality when you ain't stopped stealing the money at the church? You haven't stopped calling the people. You haven't stopped sleeping with your mistress. You got a girlfriend, a secretary, and a wife. Come on, somebody. See, that's real things. So what happens is we make a deal. I don't talk about your sin, you don't talk about mine. That has killed us in the church. And then when it gets out to the world, we look embarrassed. We look like, oh my God, the church looks terrible. Look what came up. Let me tell you something. You can't have that kind of sin. Homosexuality, lesbian, stealing, murderer, lying. You got liars in the pulpit. You got cons in the pulpit. And don't nobody know until the news brought it out. Nobody knew you was getting high till you died in the hotel room. Nobody knew you had a girlfriend on the side till you got caught. Nobody knew you were struggling with homosexuality until you got exposed. The devil is a liar. There's too many secrets. And how many people that you call armor bearers is your secret agents that cover your sin. How many folks ain't armor bearers in these big large churches? They are the hiding society. The CIA, secret connection, that's what it is. And I'm telling you, it has become kryptonite in the church. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Real talk. This has hurt us. And it has caused divisions. So those who know the secrets are separate from those who don't know. And you'd be surprised at the things that goes on at a division in the church. We don't want to take communion together. We're not one. That's another thing. We want to get together and have communion. Do, do this often as you will. Communion means common union. It's to come together as one. I don't like you and you don't like me, but we're taking communion together. We ain't taking communion. That's why it brings death into you because you're not worthy to understand the reason for oneness. This is so important, okay? And it's become kryptonite. When we don't get along, we can't fellowship with our brothers. When I, when I was growing up, you know, my mother was Baptist my, and, my, and, my, and my grandfather was Church of God in Christ. Well, when I would go home to Youngstown and be a Baptist and sometimes I would want to play at the conventions at Church of God in Christ, they wouldn't let me play because we don't, we, at that time, you know, they didn't fellowship. And that was an error and God and began to heal it. And now that's not the case, you know, when I was raised in Youngstown and Warren. But when I was growing up, that was strong. And they used to sing a song. You can't join in. You got to be born in. This is the Church of God in Christ. And this is not an indictment against the Church of God in Christ. This is an indictment against division that if I say I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and he died for my sin and I've been a man being Christ a new creature, you should embrace me whether I am denominational, whether I am apostolic, whether I am Baptist, whether I am Christian charismatic, regardless of what I am because there's only one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. This has become Christianite when we can't get along. So it has hurt us in every facet I can think of. It has hurt us financially. We're struggling with small churches. We're struggling with oneness. There's people that I need that may not be part of my denomination, but they have the medicine that I need. That's essential. 
But it become critical because I can't unite with everybody because when well, you know we arguing over should women preach and we arguing over should you baptize in the name of Jesus, should you baptize in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. We arguing over should you be clean cut or you can't have a beard. We arguing over I have this kind of anointing, you have that kind of anointing. We arguing over I like hooping or you like teaching. Uh, that all that division is has become kryptonite. 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 You can't preach in my pulpit. You can't be in my pulpit. Kryptonite. It has hurt us in the body of Christ. Next point I want to talk about, and this is a big one. This, this, what, what I'm talking about right now, as Fred Sam would say, this is a big one. I'm about to come with you, Elizabeth. This is a big one right here. Lust. Lust in the house have become kryptonite. It's a sad thing you can't even go to a revival half of the preachers sitting in the pulpit with their legs crossed, no type of worship, don't want to bless God, but soon church is over trying to get your phone number, lusting with you, you a man of God, you just got finished laying hands on people, after all the call you sweating, I'm thinking you highly anointed, you trying to figure out, you want me to know what hotel you stand at? This is sad to say in the body of Christ, this lust spirit. These Sometimes these big preachers, they come into town. I'm telling you what I know. I'm telling you what I heard. They'll call you and say, Doc, make sure you have some girls for me when I get there. Well, you may have some girls for you. You're supposed to be coming to preach the word of God. You're supposed to be on your face. You lusting after the church. And every church has a certain amount of people who basically sleep with the preachers coming to town. Uh oh, I'm exposing it all. This is quick tonight. When you're sleeping with the people, you must go to do revival. You just slept with them, so now you can't come back next year because the rumor got out. Uh oh, or it's okay for you to come back because that church agrees with that. Uh oh, and I, I'm not telling you what I made up. I'm telling you what I know. I, when I was younger in churches, I remember going to churches and I remember certain people who were set aside. And the principal would say, Doc, what you want to do? You want to meet these girls tonight? Or you want, you, want, you want to go home? Oh, yes, 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 yes. This lust is crazy. It's in the church. It's in the choir. It's in the pulpit. Everybody want to have sex, 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 sex. Where is sanctification? Where is holiness? My God, I've never seen so many lustful bishops, lustful apostles, whether they male or female. It ain't just the male coming. You got lustful females too. Oh my God, when they hug you, they want you to feel the chest, their chest all on your chest. Have them coming. Now we got this new dress code. You can show clean. I mean, it's just going crazy. The lust spirit, who's having sex, who didn't touch who. I mean, spiritually and naturally and emotionally, it has hurt us. As the body of Christ, we must known for the sexuality in the church than we know for being prayer. Oh, we're not known for altar call ministry. We're not known for casting out demons. We know for how many women go to this church. Man, they got some women over there at that church. This spirit is crazy. It's lustful. You can most of these men, you know you got a wife. Your wife is right sitting on the first row, and you wicked at me while you're preaching. You're trying to get me on the sideline. You see me at the store. I was just touched by your word, but you're a different man at Walmart than you was in the pulpit. This is crazy. We got Roman eyes. Your eyes are Roman all over the place. You know when somebody look at you, it ain't no sanctified look. They're trying to see, uh, are you down? Are you down? I'm down. You know what? I'm a preacher, but I ain't that I ain't that safe. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I'll tell you about God. God, but I also tell you about some other stuff. Yeah, this lust spirit is crazy to the point now that it's in our generation, it's in our children, it's wild, it's it's it's, it's embarrassing that this thing has not been dealt with, and it has become kryptonite, 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 kryptonite. You got more saints on on dating services than you have in the world. You got uh, come on, you got more single women in the church. That will sleep with you and pray with you. Uh-oh. Yeah, this lust spirit. Yep. Will be with you. Yeah. And I ain't going to call no name. I, I can call some names, but I won't do it. Uh, I, this one preacher was doing a revival. And he would preach the Monday night and sleep with the girl. He preached Monday night. And then after the revival, he take her to the hotel and he sleep with her. And then Tuesday night, he preached and take her to the hotel. Tuesday night, sleep with her again. I'm talking about a true story, what I know now. Wednesday night, uh, sleep. Preached at the revival. Wednesday night, took her to the hotel, slept with her again. She married and he married. I don't know how they did it, but she was able to get away and slept with her. Thursday night, he preached so hard, she got in line and wanted to get saved. He whispered to her and said, you can't get saved tonight. We got one more night, baby. This is what goes on in the kingdom. He preached so hard Thursday night 
that she got in line and got convicted over his preaching because gifts come without repentance. And he had to whisper in her ear and say, no, nope, you can't get saved tonight. We got one more night. That's the, that's the devastating truth that happens in the body of Christ because you got a gift, but you can't control your lust. You can't control what's in your pants. You can't control your Roman eyes. You touching people with the wrong touch. When you lay hands, you send a sensitivity to them to make them say, I'm available if you want me. And you understand that the anointing is attractive. It's attractive when you can preach and teach. It's attractive when you can declare the word of God. But you're supposed to have discipline. You're supposed to have control. And this has become kryptonite in the body of Christ. Oh, my God. Okay, I've got 16 minutes. Next point, the next kryptonite I want to deal with. Is immaturity in leadership. Immaturity in leadership. You should not let a novice teach. I don't care how gifted you are, you need character. This has hurt us when you got gifts in the pulpit without character, no substance. You don't have a prayer life. You, you listen, I don't care what you be able to say, you have to qualify what you say. You, there's a walk that must qualify your talk. People always say, you know, practice what you preach. I say only preach what you've been practicing. Don't preach it if you haven't been practicing it. And we have an immature people in leadership. And immature people in leadership, it damages families. We broke up marriage. I'm telling you what I experienced. I was a child preacher. Just because I have a gift at five, I can, I can have a gift at five years old. I can have a gift at 12 years old. And I can read in there, love your wife as Christ has loved the church. Yeah, you know what? The Bible do say love your wife as Christ has loved the church. But you're 12 years old. You don't know nothing about no wife. Your brother ain't never slept with your wife. Your wife ain't never came home at four o'clock in the morning. You have no experience behind what you have been reading. See, this is the, preaching is, is, the, is declaring what you are able to walk through the power of God. And immaturity, when you are spoiled, we got spoiled brats that have title. What happens if you are a spoiled apostle? What happens if you are a selfish prophet and you are in leadership? What if you are an idiot in an office? What if you are a fool with power? You know how devastating that is to give somebody that much authority because people believe in the title preacher. The office itself has, has, has authority behind it. You can control people when you have a title behind your name. You can manipulate people. You know, I, I was in one year, at one time in my life, I was afraid of preaching because I noticed how powerful people will respond to me. <coughs> I remember my cousin at one time, my cousin, <clears throat> she told me, she said, look here, you got to be careful. They called me Vail. She said, Vail, you got to be careful. I said, why you say? She said, you're powerful, Vail. Your words are so strong. I said, really? She said, yeah, Vail. She said, Vail, you can say something is blue one day and everybody will believe it. And you can come back the next day and you can say it's now green. And everybody will change their mind and believe it's green. He said, that's how powerful the gift God has given you. Do you understand how scary that is? You know what the problem is, really, of why we have crypto in church? Because we don't have preachers that have the fear of God anymore. Nobody's afraid of God. You're so impressed with your gift. You're not afraid of that much power. You, you're not afraid of that much authority. It's, you should be nervous that when you say something that people listen. I remember the first time my dad heard me preach, really heard me preach. He said, wow, son. He said, man, when you open your mouth, everybody gets quiet and they listen. He said, man, you got something. Do you know how powerful that is? Where is the reverence? And when you don't have this, it, your immaturity because of your gift can damage people. You need wisdom to be in leadership. It's kryptonite when you don't know what to do with married couples. You don't know what happens. I remember in, in my church, I made a lot of mistakes when you have married people who are having issues in their marriage, but they're part of your ministry. And then the husband come and say, you know, you should sit my wife down because my wife is not doing right. And you don't want to sit her down because you want to use her in the church, but her marriage is not strong. You got to have wisdom to make those type of decisions. Immaturity will hurt us when you know that your homos are off the hook, but you got but you over Sunday school. You know that your ego is off the hook, but you are the praise and worship leader. Oh, this has become kryptonite because it's just as much as you can preach, this is as much as you can sing, this is as much as you can teach. You will cuss people out, 
tell people off, making decisions for people, control people's thought life. You don't have people going down the wrong road. You don't have people believing it's God when it's not. You can convince people that God going to do it when God never gave you a word. This is kryptonite. We must make sure that people are seasoned. Season in the body of Christ. And I'm not talking about season. You know, most preachers want to come. Doc, teach me how to preach. No. You know what? Don't ask me to teach you how to preach. Ask me to tell you how you can live. Are you living what you want to say? Are you living what you want to say? Because immaturity will become kryptonite. You know how many people are damaged? You know how many people have been hurt because of immaturity? I remember when I was growing up and they used to have this thing called, uh, 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 Mandatory, mandatory. I'm making a mandatory meeting. Mandatory meeting. I, I, I was in the one pastor. He called a mandatory meeting at 12 midnight, and I was married at the time. I said you better not get up out this bed at midnight. Ain't that mandatory? Hey, who died? And if they died, the funeral home is closed right now. All you can do is call the people, have them come, tell them about the body. But ain't nothing we can do at 12 midnight. We're not meeting about no church at 12 midnight. That's too much power. But the immaturity, your ego, you can get offended. So as a leader, I'm offended. I'm calling them a mandatory meeting. All these things happen. And I can go on and on and show you illustrations of when immaturity is in leadership, how it damaged people. You set people down. You lift people up because you have authority. You, you call yourself the set man of the house. But what if you're the set man but you're an idiot? See? People always say, well, you know, God used the donkey. God, God, God used a donkey, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm not cussing, but the Bible refers to him as a jackass, you know. He's a donkey. We understand that. But guess what? God did use the donkey, but who wants the donkey as a pastor? Who wants a donkey as a leader? That was, a, that was an occasion in which God did that because the prophet was stubborn, but that's not what God requires out of leadership. We shouldn't have uh, donkeys in leadership. See, real talk, and this has become kryptonite. I got nine minutes. Point number two, that was just point number one in all the branches from point number one. Point number two I want to deal with, what has become kryptonite? Because we have no longer have the consciousness that I am my brother's keeper. I have a responsibility to the brothers. I have a responsibility to the sisters. I'm called to deal with men. Now, a lot of women listen to my teaching, but I've been, I've been called to deal with men. I'm an apostolic father, and I help people with sons to become fathers. That's what I'm called. But I understand my responsibility to people who I'm connected to. What kryptonite is because nobody has any accountability in the church, and I'm not dealing with control. Control has become so strong that we don't even know how to have accountability because people have, again, put on the mask of, of, of control and call it accountability. When accountability is not control. Accountability comes from your love for who you are and what you're called to be and I'm making you accountable to become what God called you not to fit my program and to build it the way I want it. Okay? But God asked, asked you know, where, where your brother at? Where, where's your brother? And he said, I'm my brother's keeper and right now people can be left from the church people can be lost and nobody cares. You ain't been in church in three months, you ain't got a phone call. Because we're no longer our brother keeper. This has become kryptonite when you are in the body of Christ and you don't care who is connected to the vision. You don't care who's been wounded. You don't care who's been lied on. You don't care who's been ostracized. This is kryptonite when there is no linkage. I need my feet to help me walk to the couch. I need my eyes to help me see how to, how to put medicine in my mouth. I need my tongue to work with me to swallow my food. I need my, my intestines to be able to work the way it needs to work. I need everything in the body to function together. But if don't nobody care about nobody and everybody's selfish, this is kryptonite in the body of Christ. That we are not concerned about our brothers and sisters. We're not concerned about those who have labored among us. And the Bible says, know those who have labored among us you but this selfish this 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 uh isolation this I'm fishing with my own fishing pole I got the people that I like in my church and they my men they my they my team this has killed us in the body of Christ Woo! accountability and accountability come from love do you really love who you worship with do you really love I want to sing in the choir with nobody who don't love me I want to work with nobody on the evangelistic team 
on the teaching team and they don't love me. I don't want you to love me for what I can do. I want you to love me for who I am. We are our brother's keeper. I should be certain that even if you have strongholds in your life, even if you have issues in your life, I should join in and help you fight. You should be able to confide in me and share with me where, what you're going through and I can say you're not by yourself anymore. When you go, when you get that trouble, call me. Matter of fact, I'm going to call you every night before I go to bed and I'm going to ask you where you are. And I'm going to be so uh, close to you and con in and, and contact with your spirit that I'll be able to hear your voice and know where you are. I'll be able to look you in the eyes because I, I see you. See? What has become kryptonite because we don't see nobody. What happens to the mothers that can see you? And they can prophesy and call what is to where it needs to be. Who can water it with their words. Who can make a pronouncement over your life. Woo! Jesus. This is so important. And without, without brotherly love, Bible said, let brotherly love continue. Who, how should you know me? Those who have love one to another. I don't want you to have love for me and never get it to me. Two in the Greek means pass how you feel, pass your opinion, pass what I'm going through, pass what you're struggling, get it to me. That's how we know one another love. There is no love in the house and it has become kryptonite. We are strangers in the fellowship. How are we strangers in praise and worship? How are we strangers on the same team? How are we strangers if we're all, and the six of us are the ministers in the church? How are we strangers? How do we not know one another and what you're going through? How can, I, how can I see another evangelist and not know the struggle what it is to be evangelist? When I see people who are highly anointed, I know that they're dealing with some sexuality because anointing comes with sexuality. If you worship God, that's intimacy. Well, what happens when you're not worshiping? Your flesh wants to be intimate. So you show me somebody who's highly anointed. I show you somebody who has to deal with the controlling their flesh. How can you know how much trouble it took for you to be under control and submissive and bring and beat your body's injection and not know the next person what they're struggling? Because we don't care as long as you sing, as long as you preach, as long as you teach, as long as you give me your money, as long as you show up for the picnic, as long as you cook the food, as long as you run the sweeper, as long as you clean the walls, then you know what? I don't care about your marriage falling apart, your children are out of control, I don't care that your bills are due. I don't care. You got sickness in your body. Just make sure you don't miss this week's Bible study. And these type of consciousness has become kryptonite. Our survival depends upon the healing. God, I feel the Holy Ghost. Our survival, the, the kingdom survival, depends upon the healing power of love. It depends on it. I come to church because I believe somebody loved me. Come to church because I believe somebody understands me. You can't survive if you don't have love in the house. David's name means love. If David's not in the house, sheep are not coming in. We don't have a lot of people who are never coming to the building again because they don't see love in the house. I know I got an issue. I know I got a stronghold. I know my flesh is, 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 is going wild. I need to know, can you love me until I change? I need to know, can you love me until I get it together? Or until God get it together for me? I need to know, can you love me in the midst of the process? We won't survive if, if one of our kryptonites is that we have the lack of love for one another. Woo! The healing power of love is the strongest dependency of the church. Love suffers all things, endures all things. So important. Okay? Do you know when you study the 12th chapter of, 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 of Corinthians, it deals with gifts. You deal with the 14th chapter of Corinthians, it deals with gifts. The 13th chapter is the middle, what we call the love chapter. In every gift of the Spirit, it should be operated through the Spirit of love. Why do you want to be a prophet, but you have no love as a prophet? Why do you want to be an apostle, but you have no love as an apostle? Why do you want to be an evangelist and you have no love as an evangelist? You should not operate on any of your gifts, whether it is a gift of prophecy, whether it is a gift of knowledge, whether it is the gift of the Spirit, whether it is the gift, gift that God has given you, administrative, all of those should be centered, because the center chapter is the 13th chapter, so the 12th chapter of gifts and a 14th chapter of gifts should be wrapped into the center of love. I've never seen so much gift in the church and so much absence of true love in God's house. Woo! This has become kryptonite. 
Nothing weakens you more when you don't get the love you should get from one another. Oh my God. I put on survival depends upon the healing power of love. True intimacy is intimacy with purpose and vision. One of the kryptonites that we have is we're, we're intimate with the wrong things. I should be intimate that you understand the vision and that I'm working towards the vision. You are part of the vision. It's a hundred piece puzzle. In order for us to see what the puzzle looks like, it's important that you be in place. I'm concerned that God sees the picture. So by because I'm concerned that God sees the picture, I'm concerned of where you position. Because I need you to be in place so that the picture can be revealed to us. This is so important. See? Intimacy. We want to be intimate with their money. We want to be intimate with their children. We want to be intimate with the women. We want to be intimate sexually. But we're not intimate with purpose and vision. This is kryptonite. When half people who go to the church don't even know the vision of the church. What's the vision of the house? What is the intimacy of the house? What is God making love to at the house? What's the purpose of the house? Why did God raise up that ministry in that city, at that place? Why are these people here? Why are you here? You are here to bring a significance and a reason to the place. I need to know the importance of what you bring to the house. And it's kryptonite when I'm working with people that don't know what you do and why you do it. I don't know who you are. I need to know who to pass the ball to. I need to know who's strong. I need to know who's equipped. I need to know who's trained. I need to know who has discernment. I need to know all those who I labor with so the vision can come to pass. But it's kryptonite when we don't have love for purpose and vision. And for one another, and I refuse to get with you because you had my dress on last week. I refuse to get with you because I heard that you got three babies without a husband. I refuse to get with you because you got a better language than me. I refuse to get with you because last week when you sung, they went crazy. But when I sung this, the Sunday before that, people didn't even show up for choir rehearsal. I refuse to get with you because I don't like the way you look. I refuse to get with you because you like the guy I want to be with. He'd rather be with you than be with me. So I don't want to get along. These things have become kryptonite in the body of Christ. Oh my God. Let me finish these last points and I'm going to come to a close and do part three tomorrow. Question. Do you know your leader? Do you know your leader? One of the kryptonites that have hurt us is that when church began to grow, we didn't know how to keep intimacy with growth. You're supposed to multiply. You can't have a, a thousand people in one building and think you pass on a thousand people. You can never be intimate unless you sign people to people. You have to assign people to people. Do you know your leader? Do your leader know your phone number? Do your leader know your demons? Are your, is your leader aware of your strengths and your weaknesses? If you're part of a ministry and you don't know your leader, no, I'm not talking about knowing his name. Do you know him? Do you know what he struggles with? Do you know what the promises is on his life? Do you know without a doubt that God has given him something and you're going to help fight to make sure that he doesn't get robbed, he does, he, his gifts doesn't get stolen, that he doesn't get hurt, he doesn't get wounded because you know who he really is? Or do you just know his name? You probably don't know where he lives because he won't invite you over to his house. Oh, you better not miss tithes, but you'll never know where he stayed. You, you don't know what his living room looked like. You never rode in this car. Now, I know this is hard to say, because should, should everybody ride in, in the car? No, but there are at least five or ten people in your local assembly that you should have a connection with. Not just the pastor, but leaders. And if that leader you're not connected to, the leaders that are underneath him should have a connection. Jesus had him. He had the inner three. Then he had the 12. Then he had the 300. Then he the 120. Then he had the 300. And it built it's called cell groups. That's important. We have kryptonite because we don't know those who labor with us. We don't even know where our strength, how, how can you pull on my anointing when you don't know where my anointing is? There's a story one time when there was an airplane flying and somebody got sick on the airplane and somebody hollered out, is there a doctor in the house? Is there a doctor in the house? And there was a doctor at the back of the plane. He came up, he helped the lady, and the lady didn't die because the doctor was on board. But he had to be identified in order for him to help the patient. How can we have sickness in the house and we don't know who's on board? 
See, even on Sunday mornings, a lot of, God, I feel the Holy Ghost, a lot of Sunday mornings have become vain because you don't even know how to pull on the anointing. Like, I'm, I, I have an apostolic anointing, so I'm very revelatory. So if you pull on my anointing, when you're listening, I want more, God. Give me more, give me more. I will feel the pull on my anointing, and there'll be a greater release because you pulled on my anointing. We have to know that. You have to know me. So you come to know. I understand Jesus. I, I know what God showed me about Jesus. He has revelatory understanding. He has wisdom. And because he knows those things, when I listen to him, I don't sit there like a puppy waiting to get crumbs from the table. I sit there saying, God, I want to pull on what you have possessed in him. Like what was the issue of blood? When she touched him, she touched the virtue out because she pulled on knowing who he was. This is important that we understand. But when you don't know who you labor, you don't know who to pull from. You go all the way to a, a Jinx convention, going all out of town, paying for hotels, flying somewhere, and you have that same anointing sitting next to you every Sunday, but because you don't know who you sit next to, you can't even get what they possess. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. This is so key. Do you know your leader? Do you have a real relationship with those who... And this is so deep, we love to quote that scripture, you know, uh, uh, be submissive to those who have rule over you. First of all, that's out of context. Go into Greek and look up the word rule, and you'll find out that it doesn't mean for you to be, to, to, to have authority over my life. It doesn't mean that. That's the first of all. Second of all, why would I want to be submissive to somebody who has rule over me, but don't have direction for where I need to go? Uh-oh. They don't have clarity of who I am. Uh-oh. Very key. Do you know your leader? Do you have real relationship with your leaders? And, and, and I'm going to stop there. I'm going to pick up tomorrow on kryptonite, one of the most powerful kryptonites in the, in the, in the kingdom of God. It's called soul ties. I'm going to pick up on it tomorrow, part three. I'm going to start with soul ties, and we're going to name again. Uh, thank you. I hope that you've been blessed. I know I have. Father, we thank you for your anointing. We thank you, Lord, for the clarity that you have given us today, how you've opened our minds and you touched on so many issues. God, I pray again, and I'm just believing by the Spirit that you're, that you're breaking every soul tie, you're breaking every false alignment, you're breaking every cloud that was over us, that were blinding us to the truth, and we thank you, Lord, that we will no longer be hindered by the kryptonite that has entered or crept in unaware in the church. Thank you for shining the light on our situation. I even release a light into your mind. Everything that I've said, I'm asking God to bring it back to your remembrance. I'm asking for the Holy Spirit right now as I speak to you in the name of Jesus, that as you go on your day, the things that I've said will come back to your remembrance and shine a light on where you have been weakened, what has hurt you, what has wounded, and I pray that your healing begins. That your healing begins. I speak right now in the beginning of your wound that you come out of hiding. If you are a leader and you have made these mistakes, I have made these mistakes. If you've made these mistakes, I pray for a spirit of repentance. That godly sorrow come and you have a godly sorrow and you repent. You begin to repent from, a, from a controlling people or whatever the practice you may have been done. A lot of times we are culturized and you've been taught what you, you, you taught what you've been taught. And I, I break that cycle, that course has been working on you and sometimes you didn't know better. You may have been selfish. You may have been spoiled. You may have been immature. Then I'm praying now that you come to the light. You, you accept the challenge. You repent. You change from your wicked ways. If my people who will call my name will humble themselves and pray, turn from their wicked ways, then will they hear from heaven you need to hear from heaven, but you got to first turn. I pray for that right now. For every pastor to turn, for every leader, for every apostle, for every prophet to turn right now in the name of Jesus. I come against every spirit of religion in the name of Jesus. We tear down all your works of Jezebel. We tear down all the spirit of, of witchcraft. We tear down the warlocks in the name of Jesus. We now shine the light on darkness, and darkness cannot comprehend the light. We release a, a urgency and an appetite for truth. In the name of Jesus, you are now desired. You will walk out of places that are drowning you. In the name of Jesus, and we declare it done. Done. I am not teaching on Facebook just to be teaching, to have something to say. We are building soldiers in the kingdom of God, waiting for the return of Christ. And Lord, we bless your name and we thank you for it. It is done in Jesus' name. See you tomorrow, part three. 530. We're going to do a part three on exposing kryptonite in the kingdom. I love you. If you haven't heard yet, share this on your page. Tell the people. 
Tag your friends. Let them know there's a word. And I'm telling you, put it out so people can get back. You are Superman. You've been called to do things. You've been called to, to, to walk in ministries. You've been called to spread your wings. But you are under something that is stopping you from flying. Stopping you from dreaming. Stopping you from having a vision. Stopping you from prophesying. Stopping you from established foundation. But I declare that your kryptonite days are over. Superman must leave kryptonite. You must walk out of a place that is causing you not to grow into the image and the likeness of Christ. In the name of Jesus, we declare it done. See you tomorrow at 530, part 3 on Kryptonite in the Kingdom. Pray for me and my family. Cover us in prayer and we love you. God bless you, Brother Ernest. Hope you get a chance to go back and listen to it. Love you, man, and God bless you.